on the floor today to talk about some positive news and some positive news that happened just today. It's not about coronavirus. It's not about politics. Uh, it's not about Hurricane Isaiah. It has to do with some urgent and historic help for our national parks, something that is really important to all of us. We all love our parks. Today, President Trump signed into law the landmark Great American Outdoors Act, landmark bipartisan legislation that will protect and conserve our public lands. I'm happy to see this effort finally cross the finish line because the natural beauty and rich history of America is something we must preserve for future generations. A big part of the new law is bipartisan legislation that's called the Restore Our Parks Act that I've worked on for more than three years with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Senator Mark Warner of Virginia was my partner in this, as well as Senator Lamar Alexander of Tennessee and Senator Angus King of Maine. Our legislation involves urgent stewardship of our national parks, which is something that I've spent more than a dozen years working on. I guess I shouldn't admit that. Sometimes things take a long time around here. But going back to my days as director of the Office of Management and Budget under President George W. Bush, I started focusing on this issue of the backlog of maintenance projects at our national parks. It's alarming. It's been growing. It now adds up to over $12 billion, far more than the parks could ever afford to take care of based on our annual budgets we provide them from Congress. By the way, the annual budget from Congress for all operations, all maintenance, is less than $3 billion. And yet there's a $12 billion maintenance backlog. When Teddy Roosevelt started the national parks, he wanted to preserve some of the most beautiful, pristine lands in America. He wanted to be sure they were going to be there for public use. It was a good decision. We now have 84 million acres of parkland all around the country. Some are those beautiful, pristine places like Yosemite and Yellowstone and the Tetons with spectacular, beautiful vistas. But others preserve our history. We have historical parks around the country. We have battlefields that we have preserved around the country to tell the story of our, of our country, good and bad. Uh, we have president's homes that have been preserved to be able to help, again, tell the story of America. Recently, I was at one of our national park sites in Ohio, and it's the home of an individual who was the first black colonel in the United States Army. He was also the first black superintendent of a national park. The home is also a site on the Underground Railroad. So it's a place where people can go and see where escaping slaves were harbored and understand more of the history, not just of slavery, but also of the cooperation and the seek to freedom that comes out of the Underground Railroad. This is the Charles Young home uh, near Xenia, Ohio. So our national parks are really important for so many reasons. And yet, during the past couple of decades, we haven't taken care of them as we should, and this backlog has built up. People appreciate our parks. During the past decade or so, we've had about a 58 million increase in visitors to our national parks. More are coming every year. Why? It's a relatively inexpensive vacation. They're beautiful. Uh, people from all over the world know about our national parks, and it's one of the things they love about America. The problem is that when these people visit the parks nowadays, they're going to find that over the years, we haven't kept up with these maintenance needs. So the water systems, the roads, the bridges, the bathrooms, the visitor center, some of the trails, many of these are now in bad shape. Some are closed, actually. When you go to a national park, you may find that a facility is closed because of a lack of funding for the deferred maintenance. We just haven't had the funding to do the capital improvements we need so that they can stay functional. Just the other week, I visited this, uh, I saw this firsthand at Cuyahoga Valley National Park in Northeast Ohio. It's a great park. It's the 13th most visited national park in America. It kind of runs between Cleveland and Akron, Ohio. Uh, it suffered from these deferred maintenance problems for years. I saw crumbling trails. I saw tr trails that were falling into the Cuyahoga River that couldn't be used. I saw rusting historic train tracks that run through the park. It's a sort of a tourist railroad that runs through, and train tracks are an expensive thing to replace, and yet it has to be done. Uh, I saw a bridge that was really unsafe to be on and has to be restored. It's a historic bridge. We want to preserve it, but the costs are just too high given the annual budget for that park. Their maintenance backlog at that park alone is $50 million, and yet their annual budget is about $11 million, which goes to the rangers and the programs and the maintenance and operations, but 
is not enough money to take care of these big problems. In a way, by not fixing these problems, we're also increasing the cost. Think about it. These costs compound year after year. In your own house, you might think about what happens if you don't fix the leak in the roof. What happens is the drywall you know, begins to have problems. You might have mold. Uh, the floors begin to get wet, and the wood floors begin to couple. Uh, you have additional costs. If just you had fixed that roof, <laughs> you wouldn't have. Well, that's where we are with the parks. If we take the time and the effort to make the fixes now, we'll save money over time for taxpayers because you won't have the compounding costs. Every day, it gets worse and worse. Now, finally, we've come up with a way to deal with it. Congress has asked our parks over the last few years to give us their deferred maintenance projects with specificity. What are your priority projects? What are the top priorities? We've asked them to lay it out in detail. Uh, it's been very helpful because we now know we have over $12 billion in maintenance needs, but about $6.5 billion of that is high-priority projects, the projects most in need of immediate attention. We know what they are. They're shovel-ready. They've been vetted. Uh, so we're proposing a source of funding to be able to deal with that because, again, the annual appropriations process doesn't come near enough to matching what we need to have done. The highest priority needs at the parks is about $6.5 billion. And in this legislation, now law of the land, royalty income is taken from onshore and offshore oil and gas, and some of that royalty is directed toward this use. The next five years, enough of that funding will be there to deal with the $6.5 billion, half of the maintenance backlog. We'd like to do better, but frankly, this is historic. Never have we had so much funding go to the parks. Never have we been able to deal with these backlogs that have built up over years. It's really a debt unpaid. That's how I look at it. So it's something that we should have been doing all along. We weren't. The costs have now snowballed, and now we need to deal with it. So it's not so much a new re responsibility as it is stewardship we never did in the first place. So it's a debt unpaid. Second, again, it's going to save us money over time, assuming we want the parks to be working, we want the trails to be open, we want the visitor centers to be welcoming, all of which, of course, we do want and we must have. The bill is not just important for our parks, but also our economy, too, because these projects are infrastructure projects. Talk a lot about that here, how to get more jobs in our economy right now with the impact of coronavirus on our economy. We need more opportunities out there. Infrastructure is one. Well, these are infrastructure jobs. Over 100,000 new jobs just with this legislation alone. And again, these projects are shovel-ready, they're vetted. Uh, they are ones that Congress, thanks to our asking the Park Service for the information, knows what jobs are out there and what projects need to be done. It's a long-term investment, too. As of 2019, visitor spending in communities near our parks resulted in $41.7 billion of benefit to the nation's economy and supported 340,000 jobs. So it's new jobs in terms of construction, but it's also ensuring the parks continue to be able to be attracting these visitors, which adds such a big economic boost to our economy. I'm proud that Congress has come together as Republicans and Democrats in a nonpartisan way to support this important initiative. And I'm thankful for the president and his support. He showed bold leadership by saying, you know what, we're going to do this. Other presidents have talked about it. In the last three or four administrations, we've talked about it. Again, I've been working on it for a dozen years. Now we have actually been able to do it. I also want to thank the Director of Office of Management and Budget, Russ Vogt, for his help, the Secretary of the Interior, David Bernhardt, and other members of the President's team, including Ivanka Trump, who's always been strongly supportive of our national parks. This is about responsible stewardship. These repairs were a debt unpaid, and we're finally addressing them before the costs increase. Our parks have stood tall for more than a century now as the embodiment of American history and our short, shared commitment to preserving some of our most magnificent lands. Thanks to Restore Our Parks Act, we will now ensure that those parks stand tall for centuries to come. 